Focusing on the second lesson, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting at verse 1. If you want to open up your Bibles to that section, you can see it. We'll be referring to that throughout our sermon today. Two men were fishing together in a small rowboat, and one of them caught what he thought was the biggest fish of his life. And as he was trying to reel this big fish in, him and the other man were, were giggling. And they were just imagining how large it was going to be. They were imagining putting that thing on their wall. And, and as he's reeling it in, something happened. The fish went under this small rowboat and started to tip the rowboat over. And the other man fell in the water. And this other man who fell in the water, he didn't know how to swim. He's just trying to stay above water. And And so he reaches out to the man who's still holding on to the fishing pole, and the guy with the fishing pole reaches down into the water and picks up the fish and let the poor man drown. Now somebody asked me after the Thursday night service if that's a real story. That is not a real story. But it does make the point about priorities. Our priorities determine our choices in life. And when we have bad priorities, it causes us to hold on to one thing so that we are not able to hold on to something better. If I were to ask you the question, what is the main priority of people in this world, what would your answer be? I think some people would say money. Some people would say career. Some people would say family. You might have other answers too. But I think all of them could probably be put under the broad spectrum of self. Me. Taking care of me. Self. Because when self is your priority, it's going to determine so many other things in your life. The way you spend your money will be spent on self. The way you spend your time will be spent on self. The way you use your God-given talents will be spent on self. Now that is in contrast to what the Bible says about priorities. Our God gives to us a set of priorities when he gives to us the Ten Commandments. And in the New Testament, Jesus gives us a summary of the Ten Commandments. Do you remember what that summary is? It says two things. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. And that is the complete opposite of the typical priorities of self that we see in this world. So that when you put two people side by side, someone who has the number one priority of self and someone who has the priority of love Lord and love your neighbor, those two people will look very different in the way they live their lives and the decisions that they make from day to day. Priorities. They change us. And that's what we want to consider today. What's in our heart? Where are our priorities? In this section on 2 Corinthians chapter 8, let me, let me help you understand the background to what we just read earlier. A congregation in Jerusalem was trying to raise some funds for some very poor people in that area. And so the Apostle Paul wanted to tell this Corinthian congregation about some amazing news. See, the Jerusalem congregation contacted the other congregations about this opportunity. They wanted them to participate as well. And the Macedonian church in the north did. And what they did was they gave a very generous gift. And so the Apostle Paul wanted to tell the Corinthians about this generous gift. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what's the big deal? I mean, people give generous gifts all the time. But this was a unique circumstance because it says in our lesson, and I quote, that these people in Macedonia were already living in extreme poverty. On top of being in extreme poverty, it says in our lesson that they were being persecuted, probably hunted down, their families being ripped apart. And it even goes on to say that they were even giving beyond their ability to give. Look at the other phrases in our lesson. This is in verse 3. It says, They gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us, for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. They were begging to get rid of their money. It's strange, isn't it? It's unusual. Those are a set of radical priorities that we can see in those people's lives. It didn't make any sense. You see, people who are, extreme, are in extreme poverty, what do they need? They need money, but these people were giving it away. People who are being persecuted, who do they need to take care of? 
Well, they need to take care of themselves, right? But they weren't doing that. They put self to the side and thought about other people. Usually when people are begging, those are the people who are needing the money. But in this case, it was the opposite. They were begging to be able to give more. What would cause people, people who are in extreme poverty, to give that generously? What would cause people who are being persecuted to think about others rather than themselves? What would cause a person to beg to give away their money? A change in priorities. In verse 5 in our lesson, we see what those priorities are. And we see how they line up with the Ten Commandments. It says this, They did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. In keeping with God's will. That is, it says that it was first for the Lord and then for others, for their neighbor. It's a summary of the Ten Commandments. And that is what caused them to give so generously, beyond even their ability to give, to the point where Paul and others were probably saying, okay, you've, you've given enough now. You have to take care of yourself too. To the point where even though they were being persecuted, they were thinking more of others than themselves. Now the next question is, what would cause people's priorities to change that radically? And the answer is found for us in one word, one word that we find throughout this lesson and particularly in verse 1. The word is grace. This is what it says in verse 1 of our lesson. We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Now, what is grace? In catechism class, for those of you who remember catechism class, we had a definition that we, we forced all the kids to learn. The definition was undeserved love. Grace is undeserved love. And that's exactly right. It is undeserved love. God did not have to love us. He could have said, you know what, you guys ruined my perfect creation of a world. You can deal with the consequences. But he didn't. And he didn't just decide that he was going to love us. He went far beyond our expectations of what a loving God would possibly do when he said that he was going to send his son to die for you and me. That goes beyond our expectations of love, doesn't it? Do you think Adam and Eve, after they sinned in the Garden of Eden and God told them that he was going to fix this issue by sending someone, do you think they had any idea that God had just sentenced his son to death on a cross to burn in hell for us? See, grace, that definition, undeserved love, maybe that's not strong enough of a word, of a definition. Maybe the definition should be more like reckless love. Because it is, it's reckless. How many of you would sacrifice your son or daughter to save someone else? I wouldn't. How many of you would sacrifice your son or daughter to save someone who didn't even deserve it? I wouldn't. But that's grace. It's reckless love, but it's ours. That's grace. And we experience that day after day where we see our God who said he's not going to just give you and me a second chance at life. No, he's going to forgive you one, two, three, unlimited times to the point where we are able to abuse his love. We are able to take advantage of his forgiveness. And yet he still says every single time, you're forgiven and I love you. Every single time. That's grace. It's the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? We understand that. But grace was also never meant to be a gift that's simply given to us to hold on to and we don't share it with others. This is one... This is something I've been trying my entire life to help my kids understand. And I'm sure many of you parents can understand it too. I have never had to teach my kids that at Christmas time when there is a gift with their name written on it, they know what that means. They get it that whatever is behind that packaging, it's theirs. Right? It's theirs. They understand that. What's difficult to teach them is that even though it's technically theirs, they still need to share it with their sisters. That's hard for them to understand. But that's grace for us too. We love, we, we completely appreciate God's grace that he has given to you and me. 
forgiveness and faith and everything that he does for us. But now it's time to share that. And specifically in our, in our lesson, he talks about the grace of giving. You see, the Corinthian Christians, they struggled in one particular area. And the Apostle Paul, when he talks about this, he really says it in a complimentary way at first. He says this in verse 7. He says, But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. See, the Corinthian Christians, they were excited about their Lord. They were excited about grace that God had given to them. They understood that it was theirs, and so they were growing. They were growing in all these areas, faith, in speech, in knowledge, it says, um, in love for others. But they lacked in one specific area. They lacked in the grace of giving. They still clung to self as a main priority in their life in one part of their life, one last area of their life, money. They struggled with it. And someone once said that the last thing to be converted in the life of a Christian is their checkbook. And I think there's some truth to that. We understand grace. We understand what God has done for us. That's why you're here. That's why we want to learn more about it. But, but that one area of our life, where there's friction, where those two gods are meeting and fighting for number one place in our heart, that gets uncomfortable. We struggle there, don't we? But that's where grace comes back in, where grace, again, is that gift that keeps on giving. Where despite the fact that we have been, at times, cheap with God, he continues to be generous with us. Despite the fact that we have not always set our priorities where he wants them to be, he continues to keep his priorities focused on you. And he continues to forgive you over and over and over again, recklessly, even though we abuse it. But he doesn't care. That's how much he loves us. But I'm convinced that as we continue to learn more and grow in understanding grace, this reckless love from God, that we are going to shine not only in faith and in speech and in knowledge like those Corinthians, but also like the Macedonians. Despite their poverty, they gave with joy and they gave generously. And the one way that we can do that is, I'm going to, the only reason I'm using this phrase is because the Apostle Paul used this phrase. This is an uncomfortable phrase to use in the last verse where he says to test the sincerity of their love. Test the sincerity of your love. None of us like to be tested, right? Look at what it says here in verse 8. The Apostle Paul says, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. In order to test the sincerity of your love, this is what I am inviting you to do um, over the next few weeks. The first thing is I invite you to come and continue to understand 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. We're going to be focusing on that through the next few weeks. And we're going to be looking at a number of different, uh, many faceted truths about, about the stewardship of giving, the blessing that God has given to us and, and how we can shine in that grace of giving, as the Apostle Paul says here. So do that. And the other thing is too, and you'll see this in your bulletin, I invite all of you to come to the group presentations. And they're going to be starting next week, October 9th. They're going to be going for a couple of weeks. We're going to make it at a very convenient time for you. You can see those times in your bulletin. Make it a point to attend one of those. Because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about the biblical principles of stewardship. Helping you understand what does God's word say about this. So that you and I, who use money daily, can understand better, according to God's word, how to really use it in our life, in so many ways in your life. And my prayer for you, and I hope this is your prayer too, that we become like those Macedonians who excel in faith and speech and knowledge, but also in our grace of giving. Amen. Please stand.